So first of all, welcome everybody. Thank you very much for your attendance today. Uh, this is the last of a series of four seminars we've given as part of the Illinois Wheat Association Double Crop Farmers Forum. And uh, for this webinar, if you watch it through to the end and participate, we will have a screen, we'll uh, slide we will put up at the very end of this hour and that will have an IRC code on it. For those of you who want to get your immediate CEU credits, you can have your tele take your telephone out and you can scan that IRC code uh, to get those credits. If not, uh, we have a way to make sure you get your credits either by writing them in. So keep that in mind for the end of the webinar today. Um, I'm Mike Doherty. I'm the executive director of the Illinois Wheat Association. Uh, I want to thank uh, this time and recognize the staff we have and the support we have for this series of seminars. First off, Charlene Blary, our administrative assistant for the Illinois Wheat Association. Uh, she's behind the scenes helping out, keep making these things possible uh, and supports our Illinois Wheat Association for a long time here. Uh, we also have staff from the Illinois Soybean Association uh, helping us today. Uh, as they have throughout these uh, four seminars, and they have really helped promote this. Uh, that is Steph Stephen Sosterik. Uh, he is the IT specialist or serving as IT specialist with Illinois Soybean Association. And he's done a great job setting up the Zoom calls. And Jill Parent, who's a communication specialist, she's behind the scenes right now. She will uh, take over for the question and answer session after we walk through our, after we have our two presenters today. So that's more or less the, um, the agenda for the speakers. At this time, I want to recognize our sponsors that make it possible and to have these seminars and also that help support the Illinois Wheat Association. So on your screen, you should be seeing the uh, platinum sponsors and those consist of Agrimax, the high performance wheat company for uh, wheat seeds, uh, ADM, Corteva AgriScience, and Illinois Farm Bureau. So thank you, all those four uh, platinum sponsors, for they've been the sponsors throughout these four uh, events. And over on the gold sponsors side, we have Growmark FS with their Inspire Wheat Seed. We have Central Life Sciences as a gold sponsor. And we also have Seamer Milling which has been with us for a long time, very supportive of Illinois Wheat Association and their plant uh, down in Tutopolis. I should mention on ADM side, they have a new plant open the last couple of years uh, up in Mendota, Illinois. So uh, thank you all to our sponsors. So with that, I will introduce our speakers. Uh, we've got USDA agencies today talking to us both RMA, that stands for Risk Management Agency, and FSA, um, so the Farm Service Agency. And we're gonna start off with Risk Management Agency for about 15 minutes. Let's, uh, I'll introduce their uh, speaker here in a second. Then FSA will take over with their team for about 15 minutes. And then Jill Parent will step in and she will handle the Q&A after that, and then we'll do a wrap up. So with that, I'm about ready to hand this over to the Risk Management Agency of the U.S. Department of Ag and the State Director here in Illinois, longstanding State Director, Brian Frieden. I think many of you know Brian. I've known Brian for, oh gosh, uh, since 1995, Brian, when I came up here and we worked in McLean County in the same, same office uh, complex. So uh, it's always good to see somebody I've known for a long time at these uh, seminars as a speaker. So with that, Brian, I will just hand it over to you and let you finish off with any kind of uh, introductory material you want and go ahead and start your presentation. And I'll start right. stop share here in a second. All right. So you can take over, share screen with your slide. Down at the bottom, should say share screen. There you go. Very good. All right. Do you have the full uh, slideshow then? Yeah. On the showing? Yeah, it's taking the screen up. 
Yep. All right, very good. Uh, appreciate the introduction. It's been great meeting with you. It's actually been nice to do this all in person, but you know, it's been one of those years or a continuation of last year. So, you know, most of you probably are not that familiar with risk management agency, but you're familiar with the the agents and uh, and companies that service the crop insurance products. So we'll go ahead. I, I'm going to provide you a little bit of an update on COVID, and then we'll talk about some of the changes that we made on double crop in the last year, last year and going into this year. And then a couple other changes that you you might be uh, might be important to know as you go into the sales closing date to uh, March 15th. So. All right, I just start out, you know, on some program flexibilities. We've all had to change what we do uh, because of COVID this past year. And, and so the agencies try to be flexible as far as how you how you can interact with agents and how we um, how we do replants and how we do a number of different things to make it easier if you're in a situation where you maybe person in person isn't isn't the way to go. So so we extended those into the spring. And you just need to talk to your agent if you have any questions or concerns on that. But that that just gives you kind of a short list of of some of the flexibilities that we added to the crop insurance program. I want to talk a little bit. You know, I've met with you last year, and we had talked about some of these changes. So so these were changes that were implemented in 2020. The earliest planning date we had moved um, moved up. And just to be clear, on the earliest planning date, that doesn't mean that you you can't plant soybeans before that date. It just means that you you wouldn't be eligible for replant if you plant before these dates. Um, so those were implemented. Some changes last year. Uh, we will review these again next year. So so I anticipate as things change that we'll be moving those dates earlier. But uh, this is where we ended up for 2020. And then FAC, uh, we changed the final planning date to July 5th, uh, provides some flexibility and actually makes more sense. So, so we did move that date this past year. And I, I think that's a, a, something that works for everybody a little bit better. And then the following another crop, being able to ensure that separately uh, as separate enterprise units um, was something that we were able to get done this past year. And, and some of that was really pushed in uh, and with the leadership of Martin Barbary, who was the administrator uh, and farmer from Illinois, a lot of you know that that his leadership helped get that through. Change administrations, we're going to have new leadership come in, but we, we're confident we'll see the same type of leadership in RMA moving forward. So, but just wanted to bring that to your attention. Uh, these are the counties that have that double crop practice where you can insure uh, FAC separately uh, or double crop separately. So, you know, we're open to, to changing that, adding counties if, if it's something that producers in those counties want. I think the, the key to that is if we extend it and you plant double crop, then you would be required to insure it if we add add counties to it. So so just wanted to make you aware of it. If if you if you feel that there's counties that we need to add, go through the associations or contact us directly and we'd be willing to to talk about that. Um, double crop history, I think some of you probably saw this in 19 where uh, we took the second highest year uh, that you double cropped in the last four to establish how much eligibility for prevent plant and we changed that. So now it's the highest that matches the same as if you planted um, just a single crop. So, so this change, I think, benefits uh, producers that hopefully is a little bit more transparent than where we were in 19. And, and it's something we identified, you know, 19 was one of those years where we had a lot of prevent plants. So uh, a couple other changes that happened based on what happened in 19, uh, we created an exception that doesn't require acreage plant to an uninsured second crop to be subtracted from your prevent plant acre. So, so I think hopefully that's a remedy that helps there. And then in Illinois, we had a situation where maybe you alternate corn and soybeans on a specific field every year. And, and if you file for a prevent plant on corn, if you decided, hey, maybe I have a chance to plant part of that field to 
to soybeans, it would switch your prevent plant to soybeans. And it, you know, it was something that, you know, impacted your decision on what to do. So that's been uh, changed to allow you to, you know, if you would, if you can show that you normally rotate, but and intended to plant all one crop, but had the opportunity to plant soybeans, maybe it, you can go ahead and do that. Uh, so just wanted to make you aware of those changes. Uh, here's another clarification that came from that just on, you know, this is if you decided if you file prevent plant, but uh, you delayed uh, you delayed that decision because you had a chance to hair graze cover crops. You could lose prevent plant for that reason if if the reason was based on holding off the plant to hair graze that, or if you harvest a, a cover crop. So, and then there's another change, and this this had been in the prairie pothole region uh, where you have to have planted and harvested that crop one out of four years. Uh, for it to qualify. Uh, that was spread nationwide. So that's something that, uh, you know, you that, that field has to have been planted in one out of four to qualify. So that's a change that basically expands what was already in part of the country already. Uh, this, in, in 2019, you could actually have planted corn as a cover crop if, if experts said it was okay. Uh, this, they've changed that procedure for 21, that uh, corn isn't going to be uh, considered a, a cover crop. Uh, and that's put in provisions for all these crops. And that's just to clarify, um, obviously, it's uh, difficult for companies to manage and, and, and consider. So uh, this is something new for 21. It's an enhanced coverage option. It's kind of like SEO, it provides you kind of a top end band of area coverage on top of your existing coverage. Um, it starts at 86%, goes to 90 or 95. Uh, it's an endorsement that goes along with your under, underlying policy, uses the same expected yields and harvest price payment factors as uh, SEO did. And where SEO was tied to your choice of ARC, uh, this endorsement does not tie to that. So, so just something to think about if you have questions. These are all things that you can talk about with your agent as you get closer to sales closing date. Uh, quality loss adjustment, this was added also. Um, it actually was driven from wheat growers out west uh, where they maybe had quality lost they had filed the claim but maybe didn't qualify for a, a, a claim but it reduced their APH this would allow you to to up your APH based on an adjustment pre uh, quality so this is an option uh, it goes back so if you have a 10 year APH if you if there's three years where this might help you this is an option to talk to your crop insurance agent about Uh, brief levies, this goes back to 2019, and this is just kind of an update. Um, we had five counties that had breach levies that hadn't been repaired, and uh, three of those have been fixed now. Uh, Alexander and Madison, th there's still levies that were breached, and in those counties, uh, if, you were effect if you're affected by that levy breach, then you would pay a higher premium. That will continue into 21. I know in Alexander, they, they put in a rock dike uh, to make sure that the, the Mississippi stays in its, in its banks as far as navigation, but it doesn't really provide uh, cropland protection necessarily. So, so we will monitor those if that situation changes. We'll make sure and update that, but that's just a, an update for producers that might be in those counties. And then really, I just want to kind of wrap things up and talk about the options moving forward. And, and you know, we have an important sales closing date coming up. It's March 15th, um, those for spring crops. The September 30th is for fall. Uh, you know, just like you do with anything else, uh, taking a look at your operation, you know, planning for 21, 
Has anything changed land-wise or entities, your financial condition? How does, does your coverage provide you what you need? These crop insurance policies are continuous policies. So, so this is an important time to talk to your agent, to look at your options, maybe some of the options that we talked about, uh, find out what, what fits your operation. If you need to make changes, March 15th is the deadline for that. I will mention, you know, beginning February 1, we'll be in the projected price discovery period, which sets the, the coverage price for corn and soybeans. Uh, wheat's already been set in, based on September and it's 560. Uh, you can actually access that. It, it's calculated during that full month. Uh, the daily prices are logged on the RMA website. And so you can, you can access that uh, if you want to track, kind of see where you think prices are going to be. So just wanted to make you aware of that. But the key here probably is to, to contact your agent, make sure you kind of follow up there and, and see what you what coverage you have and what if you need to make some changes, this is the time to do that. And then I just show show this. This is the, the RMA website, and there's some things on here that might uh, be beneficial. And I, and I had mentioned um, the price discovery period, if you go to tools in the upper bar there, uh, then you can access price discovery and, and that information is available. Also, you can go into, there's a browser that talks about what coverages are available for your specific county. So a lot of that information is there. Um, and then, like I said, the important thing is to, to go ahead and talk to your agent to see what you might need to do. This is our contact information. We actually cover four states. We're located in Springfield. I always appreciate working with this group. You know, we'll be looking at soybeans again next year. So if you have recommendations going into that, I know the earliest pine date so it has been a, a concern. But if you also want us to extend that double crop line to different counties, that's also something that we'd be willing to, to discuss. So, so with that, appreciate participating today and uh, look forward to some questions at the end. Thank you. Brian, thank you very much. And uh, we're well ahead, we're well ahead of schedule and that's not a problem. I'm always hopeful that we'll get a number of uh, questions answered and usually by the end of these uh, webinars, we do. So, um, so we'll wait and see that. Those of you who are watching, please go ahead and uh, submit your questions into the chat box and Jill Parent with Illinois Soybean Association will be reviewing those and then um, select out ones for the uh, Q&A session. But we'll go ahead with um, the next uh, set of speakers. It's with Farm Service Agency. And let me do a screen share again here. I'll just put this up temporarily and then I'm gonna shift it over to the um, Farm Service Agency. Um, but the uh, Farm Service Agency is represented today with Wendy Mueller and Ray Gavillo, Gavillo and uh, sorry, Ray, got yeah, there. And um, uh, they are, uh, Wendy is in the, is a compliance officer in the state office for Farm Service Administration. And Ray is one of the district directors many of you have uh, worked with. So um, thank you both for your uh, offer to help present today. So at that point, I'm going to put up their slide, which is just a welcome slide. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Wendy and Ray and let them, um, pardon me for a second, and let me, um, let me get to that, get to their slide where, with their contact information. There we go. And then uh, let them go ahead and talk and you know, take your time. We've got, we're, we're well ahead of schedule, so we've got plenty of time to cover whatever subjects you need to cover. So with that, uh, Wendy Mueller and Ray Gavallo, take it away. Okay, thank you, Mike. It's a pleasure to be with you all again this morning. Uh, it's a little different than uh, the way we conducted it last year, but uh, there's more than one way, one way to skin a cat, like they say. Uh, I'm going to first start off and talk a little bit about uh, our operating procedure with the COVID uh, situation we're dealing with right now. And then once I kind of went through that, Wendy's going to talk about some of the programs that we're currently administrating. And then we'll also take some questions at the end and hopefully we can answer your questions. 
basically uh, 2020 was a very trying year for all of us, uh, not only the employees, but the producers that we serve and represent. It's been almost a year now when the COVID kind of caught up with all of us and most of us were required to telework and we could only have two to maybe three people in the county office at one time. And we were not allowed to have customers or visitors in the office to conduct business. So basically we had to try to brainstorm and come up with some different ideas and ways of conducting business rather than walking through our front door and stepping in front of our counter and conducting business face to face. And basically what we did, we did a lot more business by mail, a lot more by email. Uh, we had some offices that had some lobbies in the front of their building. We could kind of use as a drop box area. Sometimes county office staff would meet you at the front door and we'd exchange paperwork. And some county offices use the benefit of maybe of a drive up or a walk up window. It wasn't the most ideal way of conducting business, but we made it work. Uh, unfortunately, as we're moving into 2021, we're still in the same pattern that we were when we left 2020. We don't know how much longer we're, we're going to be in uh, this situation of conducting business this way. I can tell you from a personal standpoint and from all the employees I talk to, uh, we're ready to get back to business as usual, business as normal, whatever that's going to be. But in the meantime, we'll continue to conduct business like we have been. Uh, I just want to you know, give a big shout out to all of our Illinois FSA employees for the job they did last year. It was one of the busiest uh, workload years ever, and we completed it uh, under unnormal conditions. And I also want to thank all of our producers. Uh, we know this has not been the most ideal working situation arrangement for you, and you've all adjusted and worked well with us. We have not heard any major complaints or situations uh, where producers were unhappy or uh, were irate with county office folks by the way we had to conduct business. So it's been a team effort, a joint effort, and I just want to thank all of our employees and like I say, all you producers alike uh, in getting the job done. So most of our counties right now are what we still call in phase zero or the gating stage where we can only have two to three people in an office depending on the office setup. Uh, some counties are in phase one, which means we can have up to 10 employees in the county office but we're still not allowed to have any visitors or customers. So we'll continue to operate that way uh, until things change. As things change, we will make you all aware that we're uh, open back up for uh, appointments. And someday soon, hopefully we can get back into the, the front doors being open and we can have visitors in and out of the building like we have been in the past. But until then, uh, we'll make do and we'll continue to work together. So. In saying that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn the mic over to Wendy and let her talk about our programs and then we'll both be around for questions at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ray. And thank you for the opportunity to speak for you today. Um, I just wanna give a short summary of different programs that we have going on and different uh, options we have to help and service the producers of our state. Um, the one thing in follow-up of Ray talking about our servicing the producers, we do have a new software um, option to where what it's called Box and One Span. And what it is is by using Box and One Span, producers can digitally complete business transactions with USDA without even leaving their home. Uh, Box is a secure cloud-based site where FSA or NRCS documents can be managed and shared. And then OneSpan is a secure e-signature solution for FSA and NRCS customers. So if you have any questions about that, um, contact the county office uh, or you can contact us and we will try and get you signed up. Uh, it's basically a matter of you creating a username and a password you don't have to download any special software or anything of that sort. As far as our uh, programs going on, we have um, the CFAP Coronavirus Food Assistance Program. We had a sign up one that went from May 26th through September 11th. And then we had CFAP two that ended on December 11th. Throughout those two program signups, now they have come out and reopened to provide additional assistance to producers 
who suffered losses for those two programs. However, due to the change in administration, those have been somewhat put on hold. We are still taking applications and will until February 26th, um, but they will not be acted on or approved until we hear further notice from our national office. What those are is, uh, it's a top up payment to swine producers. And also it does give some contract producers some additional CFAP monies. In addition to that, we have the quality loss adjustment program going on right now. And that is for nat natural disasters that occurred in 2018 and 2019. And it's basically paid on quality losses. So what it is, is a sign up that started um, January 6th and it'll go till March 5th. And producers will file an application in their county office, their recording county office, um, one application per producer. It's a FSA 898. And what they are doing when they sign that, they are saying that certifying that they have at least a 5% quality loss on one crop or another including 4-H crops. The evidence, verifiable evidence will be provided by the producer to our offices. We will not review that at that time when you, when you actually sign the application. We will really review that after March 5th. And this is a little bit of a different sign up by doing it this way. Usually we approve the the applications right away, issue the payments. And in this situation, we are waiting until after March 5th to do that. The verifiable documentation can be anything from a sales receipt, settlement sheet, truck or warehouse scale tickets, written sales contracts, or similar records as of that. And then forage tests for nutritional values. In addition to that program, we have the WIP Plus program going on still. Um, the sign up ended uh, doo -doo -doo, October 30th of 2020. And during that time, we actually put producers on a register and took names at, in that manner to run applications. And we are in the process of processing those applications now, currently, getting producer signatures and issuing payments. So there has not been an actual deadline for our um, county offices to process those applications yet, but we are working di diligently to get those done. We have a conservation reserve program going on currently. And that is um, until, let me see in my notes, February 12th, February 12th. Um, and that is for 10 to 15 year uh, contracts. We always have a continuous CRP con, uh, sign up going at all times for special priority areas. And then we are also, there has been a forest management incentive program sign up announced that began January 19th. We don't have a whole lot of information on that particularly pro, particular program right now, but um, please kind of keep your ears open for any kind of information coming out from us on that. There's a CRP grasslands program that starts March 15th to April 23rd. And that is an annual rental payment and producers can receive up to 50% cost share for establishing approved conservation practices. We had the uh, Dairy Margin Coverage Program that signed up for 2021, opened October 13th and closed December 30th, or December 11th, I'm sorry. The Market Facilitation Program, that as of January 11th, paid $29.042 billion in the nation. And Illinois was among the top five states in payments. In addition to that, we still have the farm loans that are available to producers. Um, 
basically offer access to funding for a wide range of range of farmer needs from securing land to financing the purchase of equipment. Uh, in 2020, we made more than $4.1 million billion in guaranteed loans and more than $2.9 billion in guaranteed farm ownership loans. So you can also get micro loans for trailers, any kind of uh, storage equipment. And so you may want to check into that if you're interested in any type of um, funding avenues. We also have the organic certification cost share program that pays uh, producers must apply by October 31st of each year and it reimburses the producers 50% up to $500 per scope for the year. And that is effective through fiscal year 2023. Um, acreage reports are a very important thing to all of us um, through crop insurance and through us. You need to report your acres for, to be eligible for most of our programs. Uh, of course, wheat needed to be reported by December 15th of 2020 and spring seeded crops will be by July 15th of 2021. Um, we do have special programs for beginning farmers. If you are interested in any kind of benefits of that sort, please contact your county office. And if you're just looking for general information, you can always go on the farmers.gov website and it has a lot of uh, information on different documents, um, loan information, various um, programs that are going on at the current time. So that kind of gives you a summary of the different programs. Um, we do have one other thing is the ARC PLC signup that is going on currently. Um, let me look through my notes to find out. Goes through March 15th. Uh, currently, as of January 19th, there's been more than 843,000 contracts. And in 2020, in October, is usually when we make those payments. Uh, the 2019, we always pay a year in the rear. And in two, for 2019 PLC payments, barley, canola, chickpeas, corn, dry peas, grain sorghum, lentils, peanuts, seed cotton, and wheat all received a payment. Oats and soybeans did not. Um, and as far as anything else, I think that pretty well covers it. And we're open to take questions and answers during the time that's been allotted. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Let me get my video back up. And uh, thank you, Wendy. And thank you, Ray Gavillo uh, from the USDA uh, agent, FSA agencies. We appreciate your presentations uh, in with Brian's uh, Friedens from RMA. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Jill Parent. She's a communication specialist with the Illinois Soybean Association. Uh, we have had a couple questions come in um, and I might have a question or two as well. Uh, Brian might have some to ask uh, the FSA folks or vice versa. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Jill. Go ahead, Jill. Well, the first question that we have is, what is the best program going forward? Price loss coverage or agriculture risk coverage for county? And when does the decision need to be made? Is, who's that? To, yeah, who's going to take a shot at that? Yeah, I'll take a shot at that, Mike. Uh, basically, from FSA standpoint, uh, we're not going to give you advice as far as what's the best program, PLC or our county. Uh, we don't want to tell, tell someone that one program is better than the other. They signed up for it, and it turns out in the end that the other program was better. Uh, I know, like Farm Doc, Farm Bureau, and whatnot, Extension probably. Uh, has some experts out there that runs programs and they kind of have an idea of, of what program may be better than the other. 
So I would recommend that they check into those options. As far as when the decision has to be made, uh, March 15th is the deadline to sign up for uh, 2021. If producers signed a multi-year contract initially when they signed up for 19 and 20, that contract is still valid. So if they don't come in by March 15th, whatever election they made for 19 and 20 will remain the same for 21. But if they want to make a change in, in one or more crops from one program to the other, then they need to make sure they visit their local office, which I say visit, uh, you know, make contact by email, phone call, uh, whatnot, and, and get those revisions and changes made. Uh, one other thing I might add on that, in uh, 2019, we had a lot of producers that signed up in the ARC IC, which is individual, uh, it's by, by farm. Uh, and the reason being they had a farm that was like a 100% prevent, prevent plant in 19 due to the wet year we had. Now those individuals probably want to make a, a different election now uh, because if you get a crop planted in 21, ARC IC is probably not going to pay or not going to be a better option. So anybody that went ARC IC in, in for 19 and 20 probably want to look into their, their options as far as PLC or ARC County for 2021. So hopefully that answered your question. If not, please let me know. Okay. Thank the next very... question that we have is for RMA, what is the procedure to ensure FAC beans if you are not in approved counties? Yeah, uh, so producers still have that option to be able to insure, but they'll have to make a request through their crop insurance agent. Those requests uh, will come to our office and we'll actually use a reference county, which will be a neighboring county where there is that program. We'll use that data to set up a policy. So they'll get an individual insurance offer that they can either accept or, or reject. So so it takes a little bit more effort, but you know that those options are available. It's also available uh, if you're growing a crop that maybe isn't grown uh, in that county. Another crop uh, we've done quite a few on barley in some areas. Uh, canola is also one of those crops. Sometimes we run into that. Uh, along with that, I just mentioned a couple of things that uh, maybe I. I I could have mentioned earlier, but then uh, I wanted to mention the cover crop initiative that RMA has signed with the Illinois Department of Ag that provides producers a $5 discount on their crop insurance on the acres that they planted the cover crop that on that insured crop that, that follows that. So it's an exciting program. It started a year ago. The state's put in enough to, to cover 50,000 acres statewide. Uh, we met that 50,000 last year, just got some data for 2021, signups concluded, and, and so it had more requests than actually could uh, to cover, but, you know, there'll be another 50,000 acres that uh, produced to be able to get a discount on, on that. So it's an exciting program. It's something that we have a memorandum of understanding with the state. Uh, that funding goes to RMA, and then it shows up when you get your insurance bill as a, a, as a discount. So. So we're excited about that, and I think it, uh, you know, benefits producers and benefits uh, those that use crop insurance. So it's something that we're excited about. Uh, one other thing I just mentioned, um, you know, especially with COVID going on and and the the issues with going into the offices and some of that, you know, accuracy is a is a crop reporting uh, tool that, you know, that. Uh, leadership and FSA and RMA have uh, combined. So if you if you report to your county office, that information can be uploaded, and then the agents can download that. So to, as a starting point to have that basic crop insurance information, it also works the other way, where if you talk to your agent first and report there, that information can be uploaded, and then FSA can pull it down. So you, it doesn't eliminate trips either to FSA or RMA but it does make it easier. Um, on the RMA side, if you've got uh, uh, planners that track that and you've got that data on those maps, you can uh, use that through, uh, through your crop insurance agent to, as a starting point on, on crop insurance acreage reporting. So, so just wanted to mention that. I didn't know whether uh, Wendy or Ray had anything to add into that. 
Oh, that's funny. Uh, let's see, Wendy, you're still muted, I think. Wendy's still muted okay. there. No, that's there fine. Goes. Yep. Our next question is for Brian. Does wheat qualify as a cover crop under this program? So, you know, we talked about corn is, so wheat, as long as you're using it, I mean, it, if it was meant to be a cover crop, planted at those rates and maintained that way, it could be uh, used as a cover crop, as long as it's uh, recommended by um, experts, you know, extension or whatever, as a a, 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 a cover crop or NRCS. And that's, we had run into on corn, uh, it was recommended, but it was difficult to, for us, to, for agents and companies to figure out, okay, is this corn or is cover crop or corn as a, um, as a, as a regular crop. So, and that's why that specifically was put into procedure for 21. Our next question that we have is, where can farmers find historical data for double crop bean acreage in Illinois? by region or county? Should be a NAST uh, issue, right? NAS. That's what we're saying too, Mike. Go yeah, ahead. we'd probably agree with that. We, you know, we tried to pull that, actually some of the information we gathered when we're looking at expansion tries to pull what we can from FSA or internally, but it's not always easy, it's not necessarily uh, public information, even though we do have a summary of business on our website where you can pull um, crop insurance information. So that is something, I don't know if it breaks down that to double crop, but it is something that's uh, available on our website. We, we do get uh, annual updates from USDA NAS on by county on uh, acreage and production of, of Illinois winter wheat. So if you just go to USDA NAS and you look for county reports, you can go to their main uh, website, Washington, and look under Illinois if you want and click on that. And then you just scroll down to, to the county uh, reports and there's one whole report there showing all the counties. Yeah, and I, I just mentioned, Mike, uh, you know, when we looked at the expansion, we had to kind of a hard time looking at the double crop figures, but we used wheat planting as at, in those counties as kind of a baseline of, you know, if you had the wheat in the county, you probably are double cropping it. So right, right. not perfect, but this is what we use for, for expansion. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, very good. Uh, I'll throw one in and Jill, is there another one? Go ahead, I'll ask mine after yours. Well, I'll just, I'm just gonna ask, uh, you know, a lot of interest in the new administration, a flurry of, executive orders being sent out a lot of you know obviously a, 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 an administration wants to shake things up or change it move into a different direction are you uh let's see can you <laughs> can you speculate a little bit uh either brian or ray or wendy about directions you think uh, your agencies are going to be emphasizing or going in that would have you know, some either a new program or new emphasis in Illinois, and 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 if so, if you are free to speculate about that, uh, when would we see those new changes? Are we talking about after the fiscal year, going into like after October one of, of this year, or are we talking about next calendar year, or or what? So fire away. <laughs> well, it's a good question. I'm not sure. Yeah can really answer that because I don't know if we really know what direction the new administration is going to head and uh, and crop insurance probably a little bit different as far as as changes compared to maybe some of the FSA programs um, you know the crop insurance program a lot of it's based on historical data and 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 how the program works it has to be uh, actuarially sound which means you know it basically pays for itself uh, so a lot of those things are built into the farm bill, uh, and uh, so I don't know if I can provide you a good answer, but uh, I guess time will tell on that, uh, what direction we're heading, in, if, if we change it all. Wendy and Ray, got anything to add to that? 
Well, <laughs> the, only, the only thing I would say, Mike, is uh, to be honest with you, we have the exact same question and questions. You know, we're kind of uh, out here in limbo as well. We don't know what the new administration is going to do, what direction they're going to head. Uh, and we probably have a lot of the same questions and concerns and whatnot. So at this time, I would be really hesitant to speculate uh, on what may be coming down the pike. But I, I will say as, as soon as we get information, we will definitely get it out to our producers as soon as we possibly can. No, okay, very good. I'll hand it back to you, Jill. Wonderful. Our next question that we have is, what do you find are the top concerns or questions that you get from farmers? Wow. <laughs> um, as far as I, I'm new to the state office, I come from Monroe County um, and I've been up here since October 1st. So coming from a county office perspective, I would say the probably one of the most popular question is how can I get assistance? How can I, what, what programs do you have available and how can I get assistance? Um, that and the conservation reserve program, there's a lot of interest in signing up for conservation reserve programs. And what makes it kind of difficult for that is there's always a limited time period for that uh, every year. With this farm bill, it's going to be every year. Um, and it's usually a tight window span as to when producers can come in. So for us, you know, I mean, the companies and the agents do a lot, they do the heavy lifting. And, and so if you look at the book of business in Illinois, you've got almost $11 billion worth of coverage out there. And so, you know, we get individual questions on, on claims or, or insurance coverages at some of those, but, but we try to make sure, and I think agents also try to make sure that, you know, if we're in a year where you got prevent plant or you got claims, the important thing is if you have a question on what you need to do is that you reach out to your agent. You know, if you're thinking, if you think you might have a claim, talk to your agent. Uh, if you're gonna do something that might impact your insurance, it's always better to ask that question up front than, than try to come back afterwards and say, well, I, I should have done this. And so, you know, I think the companies do a good job of, of addressing that, but, but that's probably the big thing is to, you know, you're out there in the field if you got stuff going on and if you need to tear up a field or you need to replant or or if you think you're going to have a claim is to go ahead and reach out to that insurance agent to make sure to have that conversation up front and then, and so i guess that's the the comment and the recommendation i would have jill do we have another question that is the last question that i have did you have any come in that i may have missed I just want one, I've got a few minutes here and uh, I do want to ask because Brian and Ray and Wendy, you all have a tremendous uh, perspective on Illinois agriculture. You have decades of experience. Uh, you talk to hundreds of farmers. Uh, you're really kind of in a unique, uh, you know, they say the catbird seat uh, or to see kind of the landscape and, and, and to have seen what's been going on in Illinois agriculture over the last few decades. Any comments that may maybe not even you know part of your of your actual role with USDA, but what can you tell us that you're seeing that either surprises you or you think people in general need to be aware of that's changing the trends you're seeing in Illinois agriculture? Well, right. I'll just I'll just start out and 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 I don't know if it and I'll relate it to to what what's what we see as far as you know, continuing trends. And I think the important part with crop insurance is that we try to keep up with those trends to make sure that the products that we have available, the insurance that you go buy meets your needs today and tomorrow, not 10 years ago. And, and that's why we're looking at crop planning dates, trying to keep up with that. You know, we're probably a little bit behind where, where some producers think we ought to be, uh, but we're trying to look at the whole state. And so, 
you know, the other thing is getting input from from grower groups and producers on, you know, is this product working for you? And and is there something that we should look at? Because, you know, the only way we can keep up with the changes in agriculture is to get that, that input from the field. And, and we wanna make sure that the products that you get, the products you buy and put your money into work for you and and we stay up with current trends. So, so er, planting earlier, I think soybeans going in before corn in some instances, what we're seeing, uh, we're going to continue to look at those dates to, to hopefully keep up with what's going on there. We also, you know, if, if you have recommendations or something that we should look at, we're actually looking at every crop program that we offer insurance on a cyclical basis, on a three-year basis. So, so we're going to, we reach out to the organizations, but we want your input. You know, we, we may not be able to give you everything that you ask for, uh, but we want to try to make sure that we're as as uh, transparent as we can be as far as offering what you need and and you getting what you pay for. And so so our office is always available and open. Um, Mike knows how to get me if if you if you go to Mike or you go through the Soybean Association and want to make sure that door is always open. So so we want to make things make sure things work for you. Thanks, Brian. Wendy, uh, Ray, any comment about tr trends in Illinois that you've seen? Well, I think the most inter interesting trend I've seen uh, is basically the the in uptake, uh, up increase in yields. You know, I think our genetics have really improved over the years uh, as far as yield potential. And it seems like every year those yields just keep on getting a little higher. Um, not only yield potential, but I think they're, you know, they're breeding these for, you know, drought resistance or maybe excessive moisture or whatnot. And that's where I was going to kind of go with this. And I think the two biggest things I've seen is probably our increase in yields over the last, you know, 15, 20 plus years. And then also it seems like our weather, um, it's one extreme or the other. You know, we don't see like normal weather conditions anymore. Uh, you know, it's, we don't get a one inch rain anymore. We get a five inch rain, you know, or we have, a, you know, a, a longer, drier uh, spell. So I, th I think between the weather pattern changes and the yield uh, increases, it's probably the two biggest things I've noticed um, in the last several years, Mike. Very good, Ray. Um, Wendy? I would yeah. agree with Ray. Uh, the, my biggest thing is the disaster type situations we've gotten. I started with the agency in 1982 and just the the differences now that we have in our weather patterns. Mm -hmm. So like Ray said, it, they're more dramatic than what they used to be. Yeah. And it, it seems like we have, if we have a disaster, it's, it's a huge thing. Yeah, it's a bigger disaster than it used to be. Yeah, and to go along with that, I think, you know, when you look at 19 and the prevent plant, but then you looked at, you know, a lot of the, crop that got planted late, it shows that maybe that seed technology, you know, pulled through and the weather actually helped. We had a, a better crop on what got planted, but you would say very late. So, so it's changing. Things are changing. It uh, really are surprising a lot of people. Um, all right, with that, um, we did have one more question. Joe, did you want to read that off? We just got about a minute left here. Yep, so the last question we're going to answer is, Wheat DC beans are inherently sustainable. Should or could the new administration put a larger emphasis on this practice? And what was that on what? I didn't quite hear you step myself, Jill. Wheat DC beans are inherently sustainable. Double crop beans, okay. I'm not quite sure what the question is on that. Jill, do you have a handle on what that question is aimed at? Are we putting a bigger administration emphasis on the practice of being sustainable within our wheat and our cover crops? Okay, sustainability is the is the yes. question. Okay, yes. okay, sorry, I didn't quite understand myself. Uh, and you're asking, are are we putting more? The question is, are we putting more emphasis on it, or should we? So the new administration, or do we foresee them doing that? Okay. So the question is, Brian, 
and Wendy and Ray, is the new administration, is your perception they're going to put more emphasis on sustainability, cover crops, and things like that? And, and I don't know if we can answer that exactly, but I think if you look over the past 10 years or so, you know, there's been a lot more emphasis on sustainability. And I think it, well, actually, you know, it started back, actually, I hate to date myself when I began in the 80s, but I think you see increased uh, emphasis on sustainability. So, I, I mean, I think that will continue. Um, you know, whether the new administration looks at that differently, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll find out. Um, with that, we're going to run out of time. Uh, I want to, uh, first of all, uh, thank our speakers. Brian, thank you. Wendy and Ray, thank you very much. You were excellent. Uh, really enjoyed it. I learned a lot. Um, your slides uh, for uh, Brian provided us with a slide deck. Those of you listening and you'd like a copy of his slide deck, you can always go. Please I encourage you to check out the Illinois Wheat Association website. Uh, Charlene keeps that updated. You can just Google Illinois Wheat Association, it pops right up uh, and it's got a lot of information on it and um, you can get to us through that if you don't have my email address. And uh, uh, But call or email and same with any suggestions you have for how to improve our seminars, how to improve Illinois Wheat Association. We really love to hear from members with any ideas that they have that we can make things better for uh, wheat growers here in Illinois or how to advance this industry. Um, but thank you, Brian and Ray and, um, and Wendy. Also I want to thank Illinois Soybean Association for their support. They've made these four webinars go very smoothly. Uh, we could not have done it without them. That's tremendous to work together for Illinois Wheat Association to have the support of Illinois Soybean Association. Uh, and as you know, these two crops are growing together in the same year. So it makes sense that uh, they, they, we work together. So I want to thank Illinois Soybean Association for their uh, looking at, uh, to the future and, and helping uh, and working with us on that. And I want to thank Charlene Blary for all the work she does behind the scenes here with Illinois Wheat Association. Lastly, I want to um, thank our sponsors one more time. Um, you should see it on your screen there. Um, the uh, platinum sponsors, Agromax, High Performance Wheat Seed, ADM with their new plant up in Mendota, Illinois, uh, Corteva, AgriScience, and Illinois Farm Bureau that provides Charlene and I with office space and uh, the management contract for Illinois Wheat Association. And then also, and also a contributor, platinum, on top of that, platinum sponsor for these four seminars we had. Um, and then over on the gold sponsor side, uh, Growmark FS with their new Inspire Wheat Seed, uh, Central Life Sciences, and last but not least, by any means, the Seamer Milling Company with their milling plant in Teutopolis and elsewhere, and the role they play in, in being such great supporters of Illinois Wheat Association. So thank all of you. Um, and uh, I believe this will wrap it up. I hopefully haven't left anything off the table here, but thank you all. Appreciate your attendance and, uh, and uh, may you all have a, a good uh, rest of the weekend and, and following through the winter and uh, we'll, be, we'll be in contact. Oh, lastly, forgot about one thing. Sorry, almost wrapped up there. The, um, I think uh, somebody just texted me about it and I've got to find it, is the slide for the, uh, here we go. All right. I almost forgot about it, the, the uh, IRC code. So those of you looking for CEU credits, um, please uh, make sure I got right there. Please take a look at that. And uh, if you don't have it on your phone and you don't have that scanned in, just shoot us an email and we'll get you, um, we'll get you those credits. Thank you. <laughs>